Welcome to the Green Wisdom Health Podcast with Dr. Stephen and Janet Lewis, where you will learn about natural solutions to common ailments. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. Stephen and Janet Lewis. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Green Wisdom Health Show. I'm Janet Lewis. And I'm Dr. Lewis. And today we are excited to bring you another special guest. I know we keep having these on, but we are just being blessed with lots of people that have lots of information to share, and we thought we'd pass it on to you because we're not good at uh, sharing what they know as well as they could personally. Uh, The name of this show today is called Bloated, Belching, Gassy, The Fix. So... um, The special guest we have, his name is Casey. He has come all the way from Dallas, Texas. Via California. Via California. (laughs) He is one of our reps that uh, deliver us information and many of the wonderful products that you guys are currently taking. And he, he answers my questions when I get stumped. Yeah, he actually is very good at detail about origins of where these products come from he can explain a little bit about what makes them different than the big box stores that some of you think is okay to buy some of this from and uh, more importantly today he's going to talk to you about some missing connections about belching and bloated and gassy situations that may help heal your gut and give you longer life so Casey welcome to our show I appreciate it thank you for having me Sure. Are you yeah. ready to have us pick your brain? I am ready. Well, I wanted to call this show if laxatives were a major food group, but I got the stink eye on that one. <laughs> well, you might have already done that at one point. I, <laughs> I don't. I know. don't know. We, uh, you know, Casey comes here and he starts talking, and you know, Doctor Lewis is incredibly intelligent in many facets and, and uncommonly good looking. Well, so is Casey. Yep. So, I appreciate so. that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's learned about barbecue, which is super exciting for I us have. Texans. Yep, I've experienced some good barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know they put it on big big slabs of meat like they do in Texas. So welcome. Yeah. I, lear- I actually learned a couple weeks ago, don't go to a barbecue joint for lunch before walking into a meeting because you're going to smell like smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we have very a lot of people that are from California that... that uh, listen to this show and yeah. uh, can appreciate probably where you're coming from. You haven't gained any weight since you've been in Texas, have you? Uh, not yet. <laughs> y'all, y'all really did eat better out there than we do, but we're working on Texas. Um, <laughs> anyway, you know, we talked to you one week about, um, I guess, the, you know, having S, you know, gut problems, how it could be coming from, you know, lack of digestive enzymes, probiotics. Now we've got something called spores. It's very confusing. People don't know when to use what, and I have some questions regarding that. But, uh, you know, we talked about a SIBO one week, which was, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Most of you are like, I don't even know what that is. I don't know where it comes from. So, um, Casey, I guess our question is, is we need you to sort the wheat from the chaff, so mm-hmm. to speak. We need to, for you to kind of tell us where to start. How do you know which one to go with first and, and what's the ultimate goal? Sure. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you had briefly mentioned SIBO and I think that's one of these in, in any type of industry. And, and this includes medicine, there's always trends and SIBO is one of these things that we have seen. It's really, it's exciting because it's providing some answers to people where, who have traditionally been thrown into this bucket of IBS, which, you know, it's anywhere 10 to 20% of the population. This is a huge chunk of people that are impacted by this condition and there's very little answers. And it's not until recently that this idea or this theory of SIBO has emerged. And then there's been some validation uh, with some of the diagnostic tools that it's a major contributor to patients who are suffering from the symptoms that you mentioned, the gas, the bloating, the distension, the altered bowel movements, whether it's uh, constipation or diarrhea. And essentially what it is, it's it's an acronym for small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And that's exactly what it is. In an optimal digestive tract, you have different concentrations of bacteria in different areas. Comparatively speaking, the small intestine, because it is a more acidic environment where lots of digestion happens, you have fairly low concentrations of bacteria compared to the large intestine where you house trillions of cell, uh, trillions of bacterial cells. What happens in SIBO 
is you actually, for a number of different reasons, and we can dive into some of these causes if you want, bacteria begin to overpopulate and proliferate in the small intestine, then leading to premature fermentation, which is, you know, basically yes. gas production in an area of the digestive tract where there really shouldn't be, and it wreaks havoc. So your first hint is when you pass gas and your wife and your dog leave the room, you might have SIBO. <laughs> Consider. So you're saying, because, you know, a lot of people are used to just, uh, well, sadly, they're used to not even going to the bathroom every day once a day. Some of them, I, I, we still say, oh, yeah, it's, I, I had a girl the other day, it was five or six weeks, she went to the bathroom one time. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. But a lot of them think just taking like a laxative or something like that to just shove things through. Mm-hmm. That might not be the best answer. Is that what you're saying? You know, short term, short term, it can be effective just for some immediate relief. But as a long term solution, no, absolutely not. And it can actually do uh, more more harm than it can do good if you're taking some of these some of these over the counter laxatives long term. Okay, um, and and I guess that's kind of what leads me up to probiotics. You know, Doctor Lewis talks about digestive enzymes, right? That they're very needed. Oh, well, people get confused about probiotics and uh, digestive enzymes. They say, well, I'm taking probiotics. I said, I understand, but there's some overlap. You need the digestive enzymes also. And when you get certain types of pathogenic bacteria, it can produce something called zonulin, which widens the gap, creating leaky gut. So it's not always a food sensitivity or food allergy. It can be overgrowth of the different pathogenic bacteria. The key is having everything in a proper ratio, and that's what Casey's here to teach us about. See, that's good. So, uh, you know, some of you guys are used to going, I hear this all the time, you're going to the big box stores and you're going, I'm buying one of those really high amounts of probiotics, and you, they have to be cold because that's the best, and and that's taking care of everything. Dr. Lewis is raising his hand. I guess... I'm on a, like a, I feel like a school teacher. I'm calling on you. What's your answer to that? Well, uh, it's called BS uh, because, ju- you know, there's a lot of lies. Anybody that's had an ex-wife or ex-husband knows that they can tell lies. They're not all the same. Once upon a time, I had to, well, I've taken a lot of microbiology. That does not make me, you know, a super expert. I, I made an 86 one time in a microbiology course, and the lady, the Ph.D., was mad. She said, I'm in too tough for you to make an 86 and never open the book. I said, I should have made a 96. You really are tough. But I got to be friends with her, Ph.D. in microbiology. And you know what? When you get a lot of these probiotics and you put them under a microscope, most of them are dead. D-E-D, dead. Yeah, I've heard that. And then you take them, and I think some of the hydrochloric acid kills off the rest right before they get to where they need to go. You know, some of them are, and that's where the spores come in. Okay, and then no one knows about spores. I mean, this is a relatively new topic. Uh, Casey actually introduced us to this, Um, so that's why I'm going to let him explain to you when, why would you need them. I know we have a product that we've combined what we call immunoglobulins, which is a whole nother beast, um, together. And I want him to kind of tell us how to go systematically maybe through the thing so you know what to take and when. So, yeah. so Janet says that sometimes she gets tired of my animal analogies or, or you know, the ones I use, mechanics. So now Casey's going to give you the science, and he's much more eloquent than me. And yeah, uncommonly good looking. I'm I'm jealous of his beard. So, <laughs> listen closely. This guy is somewhere close to brilliant. Well, I don't know about that, but I appreciate it. Um, I know I know what I know, and don't pretend to know anything else. But you know, um, spores, as the name implies, I mean these these are in a lot of ways they're very similar to the bacteria that you're going to find in traditional probiotics. But in a lot of ways, they're also different. Um, Janet, you had mentioned their hardiness, and that's one area that they do shine over traditional probiotics, is that these are nature's ultimate survivalists. You have to understand that some of the some of the oldest organisms that we have found on this planet are actually some of these strains of spore-based probiotics that you find in products today. You know, Bacillus subtilis has been around for, as far as we know, upwards of 250 million years. What's unique about them is that 
in an unpreferred environment. So they're everywhere around us. They're in the soil, they're in the vegetation, they're in the water. When they're in this environment, they go into a protective state where they create this membrane actually around them. And it acts as, it acts as body armor. So it's a shield against the elements. And they go into hibernation. And it's not until that they are, they're picked up by generally an animal and introduced into a, a digestive tract where they are able to come out of hibernation and go back and, you know, do bring their their positive effects to the digestive tract. And like anything in nature, when you swallow these organisms, all they're looking to do is to create an environment that's good for themselves. So if that means it's getting rid of bacteria that shouldn't be there, these potential bath- pathogenic bacteria that are that are maybe uh, proliferating in your gut, getting rid of these bacteria, altering pH preferences. Helping with bowel movement? Helping, well, helping with bowel movements is kind of a secondary effect of this as we restore normalcy in the digestive tract. But that's all these bacteria are doing. And it just so happens that their preferred environment, the environment that they're working to create in your digestive tract, is the optimal environment of specifically the small intestine and that's where that's where spores are really performing well in the clinical research compared to your traditional probiotics how do you know when you need a regular probiotic versus these spores how do you know you have a small intestine problem do you have any way well i mean there's there's diagnostic tools available um, that can actually look at fermentation of carbohydrates and if fermentation, if you're producing gas, specifically hydrogen and methane, if you're producing uh, gas, is that running people out of the room? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, if you're producing these 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 gases too soon, you know, too early in a time frame, it's indicative of bacteria that are proliferating in your small intestine, and then the side effects associated with that you mentioned are generally gas bloating, altered bowel movements. Um, one subjective way that, uh, and Dr. Lewis, you had mentioned this before we got on, that you can actually kind of test to see maybe if uh, SIBO is a concern is by eliminating FODMAPs from your diet. If you eliminate these fermentable carbohydrates, and you can go on Google and you can Google you know low FODMAP foods and it'll bring up an entire list of what you can and cannot eat, but your symptoms will resolve pretty quickly if you eliminate FODMAPs from your diet. The problem is the long-term sustainability of that diet, you'll run into a lot of different micronutrient deficiencies. So it's not a long-term fix, but it's certainly kind of a band-aid that can be used in the short term, but also can be used to kind of sub- sub- subjectively uh diagnose let me let me dumb that down for a minute uh jen and i talked uh, in a previous podcast about you know she loves beans but they kind of blow her up and then yesterday on facebook priscilla geez i hope you're listening priscilla she was kind of making a joke about it she ate beans and she puffed up and and felt like if somebody poked her with a pen she would explode it hard. I mean, literally, I could go three days without eating after having beans because they're yeah. just there. And, and Priscilla said, well, you know, if I could just pass a little bit of gas, I feel like I would be better relieved. I know. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good way to judge it. You know, you can be objective. You can be subjective. I tell many people, well, go see a good GI doctor because, you know, they don't interfere with what I do. And I'm way, way not going to interfere w- w- with what they do. Sometimes the best thing is a multifaceted approach. Well, and that's, um, you know, because I've been working with Casey a little bit. He actually heard my bean comment one day when he was in our office, and he goes, I can tell you what's wrong. And I was like, okay, because, you know, hey, we're learning too. We we don't, uh, we practice what we preach here, blood work, all of that. Um, I've been doing those, uh, what we call SBI spores, which there's an immunoglobulin component to that product as well, which I'm going to let him talk about. Um, but they have helped tremendously. And then there is another product that we're in the process of having um, our label put on so you guys can find it easier. It's called Modal Soothe. I should have that the next two weeks. And I, Casey sent me a bottle of this to try to uh, see if it helped. And, and I go and I kept telling him, I don't think so. I don't know, but I think it does. And I'm, I'm through an entire bottle. I have a second one coming up, and I find myself every night going, I need those. I really think I need those. So we're just going to go ahead and do it uh, because, you know, we get so many products in here and people are kind of lost. It's like, I don't know where to go with it. But thank God we got Dr. Lewis that 
that knows. And I um, do agree with Casey that uh, laxatives are not a good right. long-term solution. He's absolutely 100% on that. Right, and that's what we used for a long time. We'd use something to help shove it through, basically. Um, but, doc, can you, Casey, can you tell us a little bit about what modal soothe brings to the table as far as the difference in what we already have? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I, kind of backing up a little bit, you know, when we, when we talk about SIBO, one of the the primary primary components of what actually allows this condition to take place is delayed motility. So this is a really really important part of the conversation. What motility is is essentially the the rate at which things move through the digestive tract, but then also your ability for your digestive tract to routinely remove whether it's food stuffs or bacteria or viruses or toxins. There's this 24-hour kind of cyclical house cleaning that happens. Um, and when that's impaired in people, and there's a number of different reasons why it could potentially be impaired from uh, hypothyroidism is a big one, diabetes and blood sugar issues, chronic infections. There's actually a pretty strong link between prior instances of food poisoning and delayed motility. Um, but then stress, which I know Dr. Lewis talks a lot about, stress is a, is a huge impact on our overall health, but especially to digestive function. Um, and so we're working with, with a product like Modal Soothe to restore normal motility. And, and what it's essentially doing, it's a combination of two raw materials. Um, it's a standardized ginger extract. Standardized is a really good word you should read into that that's more important than what you're hearing yeah right standardized is looking at specific components as you know plants are made up of a lot of different uh, compounds phytonutrients chemicals etc and when you take a, a standardized raw material you're able to isolate the the more potent medicinal components of the plant and in this case we're looking for specific what are called gingerols which actually act uh, at, at certain receptors in the digestive tract that um, you know, kind of maybe TMI, but the whole conversation around the vagus nerve, which is essentially the nervous system of the digestive tract that controls all of the contractions and the rate at which things are moving through the digestive tract. It works within this nervous system um, to help restore normal motility. And then a second part of modal soothe is... A, another standardized raw material in artichoke leaf extract, which is a class of what are called choleritic and cholagogues. And all these are simply doing is increasing bile synthesis. So promoting bile synthesis from the liver. Bile's really important that we remove bile from the body. It's it's where all your waste gets bound up. It's where all your toxins are bound up, getting it in the digestive tract. And then it's very sticky. So as it's moving through the digestive tract, it's grabbing up things that we don't want hanging around and helping to get it out of the body. So, I've got a question about that. Yeah. Don't you just get your gallbladder cut out? Doesn't that just take care of it? Because <laughs> yeah. that seems to be the standard answer nowadays. My tire when you, when you look flat. at things in the, yeah, well, yeah. Let's, cut the, let's cut the tire completely off well, when it goes about, flat. He's yeah. talking about bile. And, it's uh, like, no. and, that's for, what, and that's what's wrong. But before he answers that question, and Casey, you're doing an awesome yes, job, I'm, really I'm going to you know, kind of do this quickly i'm gonna say yes you can come back anytime yeah. you want and mm -hmm. people like alan from maine that wrote a very sweet email telling us how important it was to have jimmy on the show hey folks i want to hear from you but now for those of you that i tell you your liver enzymes are, are not in optimal range and the number one reason why the liver enzymes go up is because of your not digesting and assimilating your your uh, cholesterol it creates a cholesterol stone that goes down the biliary tree into the gallbladder those are the ones that get gallstones well it can clog up the biliary tree my analogy, you know, Janet's going to give me the look on this. My analogy is they changed the oil in your car seven times, but they didn't change the filter. Mm -hmm. And then it gets clogged with particulate matter. Usually 99% of the time it's uh, undigested cholesterol. So dealing with the bile is an absolute must. 
Oh, and I've always known that because I've always had a gallbladder problem and stress. And who's not stressed nowadays? Living with Stephen, apparently no. stressful. Well, to look at the country. I mean, it's like <laughs> you're just tied up in knots all the time. We're, it's, it's certainly an unprecedented time, and stress is a an interesting rabbit hole to get down. It's it's a topic for another conversation. But well, that's why I have my modal soothe now every night because I want you know. I guess innately, it's like, and it has helped because you have a lot of people that. Or they'll always tell us, I'm up between 1 and 3 in the morning. I can't sleep. Well, that's liver hours trying to regenerate. In Chinese traditional medicine, if it's 1 to 3, and even redheaded people have a little bit of a genetic tendency to have uh, liver issues also. And I've had redheads think that I was a quack. And I said, well, here, take this liver stuff and let's get that cleared up. And then they sleep like a baby and come back and apologize for thinking I was crazy. It's like, well, I did study a little while in China, so... So maybe there's a way around having your gallbladder removed is what I'm hearing, this right? This Modal Pro is a kick, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, go, I'm going to be very scientific. It's a, the, the Modal, what is it? Mo- modal it's soothe. called Modal Soothe. <laughs> modal Soothe, okay. All right, I'm confused. Need a, need a cold beer. It's going to be a really, really kick, but clean out your colon, your small intestine uh, product. And you, and the one thing I want to say about that, one night I did take it, and apparently I didn't have enough water with it. Casey said, do two of them at bed before you go to sleep. So I did. And about 1 o'clock in the morning, I woke up and had, it, it was like I'd had ice or something. It was so cool and soothing to the point that I thought, oh, my God, what have I done? I'm on fire inside. <laughs> and it was the ginger. Yeah. So I guess I didn't drink enough water with it. Apparently, you need to chase it with a little bit more, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm mean, gonna say take it with a. I mean, I've I've personally never noticed that effect, and it's a product that I've been taking every night now for about a month. But yeah, I just take it with half a glass of water. It's also really important too when we talk about some of the lifestyle things that you can do uh, to help with this condition and really increase the effectiveness of a product like Modal Soothe is to avoid late night snacking. Really try to emphasize a minimum of a 12-hour fast. Uh, you know, you've gone from preaching to getting mm. personal with most of my patients. Yeah, some of these people it's, are going to tell you they don't get home till really late, though, and they... Well, it's not, it's, you know what, it's, it sounds difficult to do, but when you think about it, you know, if you have... I think this is manageable. If you have dinner at 7 or 8 o'clock and then don't eat breakfast until 7 or 8 o'clock the following morning, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's you're building a 12-hour fast in there, which is significant because, you know, backing up when we talked about this migrating motor complex or just this this body's way of cleaning the digestive tract it can only happen in a rested state so when you're just constantly having to digest things it's very taxing on the uh it's very taxing on the digestive tract and it's also very just energy taxing in general so do yourself a favor and give your digestive tract a break that's why you people that have gone to intermittent fasting are getting such good results. You know, the, the word breakfast means break fast. And there's plenty of research that will tell you that the less you eat, the longer you live. Because, as, as Casey said, energy taxing, you know, you've only got so much energy. Well, you don't want to always be digesting. You want it to have time to use some of that energy for elimination and cleansing. And that's why don't think about just bowel movements, you know, good digestion. I mean, the liver is a major, major player, and I'm excited about this product. Um, so basically, I think you also sleep better if you don't eat so late, right? And that while you're tossing and turning more, that you're maybe you've eaten too late? Well, yeah, 100%. And that, that also, you know, there's the conversation being around just the actual physical, uh, you know, active digestion, but then also the 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 peaks and valleys of blood sugar in your body trying to regulate blood sugars. And that goes back to liver. Glu- you know, I'm going to have Casey back here. We're going to have him talk about some different topics. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're really good. Anytime. anytime. Um, well, the other part of this, you know, we were talking about spores. We started with spores. Mm-hmm. Um, the product that we have that you helped us combine is called SBI Spore. It's immunoglobulins. Can you talk about a little bit about, because some, some of you guys are, are used to the SBI support it's our powder i i literally have a guy that comes in here and said my bowel movements were not right for a year and a half don't you ever run out of this product and he buys two jars of it at a time uh, i've tried to hook him over to the sbi spore thinking that maybe he was missing a little bit there and you can't talk him out of it i mean literally it's like you're going to arm wrestle him down in the store um <laughs> she does that with her eyes <laughs> can, can, can you tell us 
why the combination of the SBI with the spore, what the what they do, I guess, and why they're combined. Yeah, absolutely. So think of think of SBI. So these are serum derived bovine immunoglobulins. They are they're a cleaning crew that you're putting in your gut lumen and they're bind binding to all different types of of bacteria to components of bacteria to endotoxins to undigested foodstuffs and they're helping with elimination and they're keeping these things from accessing the immune system so the thought process behind combining spores with SBI is that spores are very very effective at eradicating bad bacteria and doing so they're killing off these bacteria and anytime whether you're using spores or you're using antibiotics or you're using some type of natural antimicrobials spores are a really important part of this conversation because as these bacteria are dying off they're breaking apart and they're releasing all their innards which are very very toxic and really potent immune stimulators so they can you know you talk about you know what's called like the herxheimer's response or the uh, die-off effect a lot of times people will get uh, you know concomitant flu-like symptoms associated with any type of killing protocol sbi is there to help bind up all of these things that are being released by bacteria that are breaking down and removing them harmlessly from the digestive tract rather than having them access the immune system and contribute to inflammation that's a good point. You know, we have that every now and then. People will start our program and they'll say, oh, my gosh, I feel like I've I've got the flu. I, which one of these products made me sick? Or I have hot flashes at night. It's like, well, that's not necessarily hormonal. That, that can be toxicity. Right. Yeah, so they very much may be having some of the die-off that mm-hmm. they're experiencing, and it's a good thing they need to stick with, maybe slow right. it down a little bit, maybe drink yeah. a little more water, help push it through. Or include SBI into the protocol. Absolutely. Because that's that's going to help something that's going to, again, just keep these things. It's a, it's an immune response. The SBI by itself, and, the powder is kind of like, uh, it reminds me of Silly Putty for some reason. I mean, it kind of smells like the Silly Putty used to smell. And it kind of... And it's kind of gummy like that, so it would make sense. It's kind of and, and, filling in the holes. And to you Marines out there, you know, Janice talking about silly putty, putty, that does not mean she was eating purple crayons. She didn't do that. We're just talking about the smell there. <laughs> and I don't even know what that means. Well, that must be before my time. A right? Marine will understand. Ah, okay. I see. Okay, so so now we have these SBI spores. And then the other question is... Um, tons of people take antibiotics they're always coming in here hanging their head in shame going i realize i just killed off all my probiotics you know it we always tell them it takes a minimum of three months once you've done a round of antibiotics because it kills off the good stuff too um but there are probiotics that you can take that are okay to take on an antibiotic or would you take it after the antibiotic or or what kind of what kind of thing are you thinking with like saccharomyces and that sort of stuff yeah saccharomyces is the go-to probiotic alongside of any type of antibiotic treatment and there there are some things out there too suggesting that spores are are much more antibiotic resistant than your traditional probiotics but going back to saccharomyces boulardii or sac b for short it's used a lot even in the hospital setting alongside of antibiotics for treatment of antibiotic associated diarrhea traveler's diarrhea a uh, recurrent C. diff infection. And what's unique about it is these probiotics are actually bacteria. This isn't, and as the name implies, uh, antibiotics. They're targeting bacteria. Sac B is actually a beneficial yeast. So it's completely resistant to, to probiotics. I'm actually a proponent, uh, or sorry, to, to antibiotics, completely resistant to antibiotics. I'm actually a proponent of just daily Saccharomyces boulardii. It's really unique in the way it's constructed. Its cell membrane contains a high concentration of what's called mannose, which is basically just a simple, a simple carbohydrate. But what, but what it does is it, it's, and again, it's another one of these binders. Pathogenic bacteria like E. coli and Salmonella campylobacter they have a high affinity for mannose so while sac b is in you and it's moving through your digestive tract it's attracting all of these pathogenic bacteria and they're going and they're binding to the sac b and sac b is pulling them harmlessly through the digestive tract rather than having them adhere to your gut lumen and and proliferate and 
and wreak the havoc that they can wreak. And and so these pathogenic bacteria also increase uh, GI permeability. You know, it starts in the stomach but goes on down. So as Casey's talking about taking this, you're also beginning to heal leaky gut or the permeability. So you would you would suggest taking like the spores and Saccharomyces side by side. Yeah, I think SACB is always a good addition. And if you're going, if someone's on an antibiotic and they want to do Saccharomyces, should they just take it at a different time of day? Does it matter if they take it around the same time? Because, you know, some of these antibiotics are telling them, take them three times a day. And these people are going, where am I supposed to fit in an antibiotic, I mean, a probiotic in? Right. And that's, again, going back to SACB being a yeast. You can you can take your Saccharomyces boulardii in the in the same swallow that you're taking your antibiotic because it's completely oh. resistant. Where uh, your more traditional probiotics, you generally want to take away from your antibiotic. Very good information. Boy, I hope you guys learned something. I cannot believe we've been talking for 30 minutes already. The show's come to an end again. Uh, but, the, you know, for you, those of you that are new to listening to this show, please do not guess at your health. Uh, go to greenwisdomhealth.com, fill out our health survey. We do low-cost lab work, just in case you don't know that, and we do it local to where you are in most states across the United States. Uh, we actually had a man in here yesterday that came in here that swore he was eat up with cancer. Maybe he is, I don't know, but he had not ever had lab. We just had his lab back. He had some very different findings on it than what he would have known. He he would have never known this. He Actually, if he'd have done lab a long time ago, we probably could have headed this off at the past, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't go to a doctor. So if you're that person that don't want to go to a doctor, please do lab through us. Uh, get started today. And Dr. Lewis, would you like to leave us with some closing words? Yeah, you know, first First of all, I'm going to repeat, you know, if you like what Casey said, and I'm just all excited about it, you know, let us know through email or through the Facebook, Shooting Straight with Dr. Lewis, because it's important that he drove all this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's very, very intelligent. He helps me. I have access to people in the industry that are as smart and good looking as Casey, and it helps me be a better doctor. And he knows a lot about a whole lot of different yep. subjects. So if y'all are learning anything at all from him about this, we'll have him come back for something else. I appreciate that. I'm always always open to coming back anytime. Uh, that's good. I like that. You know, and and the thing is, these people we've had several of them come in lately that uh, don't want to get onto the medical merry-go-round. First of all, I think that's a mistake. Our medical personnel do a great, great job, and sometimes I think it's best to blend. You know, the natural approach plus the allopathic approach. So don't be afraid of the medical people. They're really good people, and they can save your bacon, you know, many, many times. Uh, I would just say sooner or later you're going to live in the consequences of your doubt or you're going to live in the potential of your faith. So throw it in, ask God to bless it, and accept but the joyous as truth. And there you have it. You guys have a very blessed week. We'll be here next time on the Green Wisdom Health Show. Once again, our show has come to an end, but your hope in your health is only beginning. If you or a loved one are in need of a different outcome and are waiting for a brighter future, take the first step and go to our website and fill out the health survey. Please don't keep us a secret. If you know someone that could benefit from this podcast, please share this show with your friends and family. You're only one step away from a life worth living.